Okay, and I do want to get to this breaking news. Check it out, a tweet from U.S. CENTCOM here. It reads that uh, CENTCOM strikes Houthi terrorist missile launchers. Now, this is the fourth strike just this week. Houthis, uh, Houthis the U.S. against Houthi rebels over there in Yemen. The full context of this says, Ongoing multinational efforts to protect freedom of navigation and prevent attacks on U.S. and partner maritime traffic in the Red Sea on January 17th at approximately 11.59 p.m. U.S. Central Command forces conducted strikes on 14 Iran-backed Houthi missiles that were loaded to be fired in Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen. I'd like to bring it to the conversation now, National Security Analyst, retired Marines Intelligence Officer Hal Kemper. Hal another strike against Houthi targets in Yemen. Now, this is the fourth one after Houthis attacked a U.S. ship earlier this week. Uh, well, they've been attacking almost one a day uh, since we did our strikes. They get out one shot a day. Uh, this one, uh, this most recent one, they actually hit it with a drone uh, with an unmanned aerial vehicle. It was a one-way drone uh, that went into the ship. Uh, they've also been using ballistic missiles, uh, but there's something that we've been doing is we've been picking up when they put those missiles on the launchers. And once we see them pull the missiles out, they're getting ready to put them on the launchers, we launch a strike mission. Now, this one today looked like mostly Tomahawk missiles, from what I can ascertain, may have been all Tomahawk missiles. There was something about the British may have done something with the strike mission. It's tough for the British to do anything with a uh, uh, a aerial strike mission since they have to fly all the way out of Cyprus, which is a very long mission, a lot of aerial in-flight aerial refueling. So I'm not quite sure if that's correct. This one looks like mostly Tomahawk missiles. They're right off the coast. They're they're fast. They're they're darn near impossible to stop once they're going in. And they hit those sites and they took out 14 uh, missiles. And I, it's difficult to say exactly what's going on. But it's likely that there are missiles and drones that are held in uh, bunkers or caves or something where they have them in such a way that they weren't hit the first time. So as they pull these things out of wherever they had them uh, safely stored and they're exposed, we pick up on that with our intelligence surveillance reconnaissance systems. And we immediately put together a, a quick response target mission. And, and that's what happened there. Now, this one that happened today was right after this, the uh, uh, the Houthis were put on the uh, specially designated global terrorist list. Uh, that's still not as uh, as legally powerful as what they were on before under the Trump administration, which is a foreign foreign terrorist organization. But it is, but it has put them into the terrorist realm, which gives us a lot more freedom of movement in terms of going after uh, finances uh, and and specifically blocking uh, Houthis from traveling around, I should say those traveling around who are part of this Houthi terrorist organization from traveling around the world, uh, from uh, from doing things in a, in a business context, if you will, but especially the financial side, uh, blocking uh, money and other things that could go to them, and also taking actions against those who support the Houthis, uh, other countries, and uh, using that as a uh, uh, justification for various different uh, instruments to uh, to basically curtail their activities. So there there is some teeth to this. Uh, obviously, the discussion is will they raise it all the way up to the foreign terrorist organization status? Uh, there's there's a lot of discussion that that's in the works, but we haven't seen anything yet. And I've heard it kind of go back and forth. Originally, I said this was the first step to go into FTO. Then more recently, I've heard well we're looking at that. I'm not quite sure where that's going to end up, but that's seems to be where they're going. Al, I do want to continue to talk about all of the tension that's escalating in the Middle East. This week, big news, Iran hitting Syria, Iraq, and Pakistan with missiles. Pakistan condemning the strike, calling it, quote, unprovoked violation of its airspace and saying it will retaliate. My question is, was it unprovoked? And what is that retaliation going to look like? I, I don't know what the retaliation is going to be. Uh, that's a really big question. and. You know, uh, Pakistan's got a very substantial military capability. Uh, I would also mention that Pakistan is a nuclear nation. Uh, I'm not saying they could use nuclear weapons against Iran, but I am saying that they are not some, a country to be trifled with in terms of their military power. Now, what they hit was they hit a, uh, it's basically, it's a, a Belushi uh, group 
uh, if you will, Sunni, not Shiite. The predominant religion in, in Iran and the theocracy in Iran is, is Shiite. Uh, they, they said they hit a target uh, in the Baluchistan province area of, uh, of Pakistan. Uh, what Pakistan's saying is what they hit killed two children, injured three other children, and that was all that was, was hurt. And that group hadn't really done anything, uh, done any sort of uh, targeting or operations uh, in Iran uh, for at least a couple, three years, uh, from what I understand. And then, of course, they, they hit a, a site up in uh, the Kurdish areas of Syria and Iraq, one in Erbil. They said that was a, uh, uh, a, a Mossad spy base or something. Of course, the Iraqis have denied that that was a, anything like that. And then there was a uh, another, uh, what they said, terrorist target that they hit in Syria that happened to be in the Kurdish area. And in both, and in, in particularly with Pakistan, but also Iraq, uh, this violation of their sovereignty and sovereign airspace has really, uh, has really uh, caused a diplomatic, diplomatic furor uh, with Iran, as far as that goes. And what it appears is this is simply uh, something for a domestic audience in Iran. As you may recall, uh, they had that, uh, that terrorist attack that ISIS has claimed responsibility for. Uh, hitting uh, Soleimani's um, uh, memorial service, uh, biggest terrorist attack in Iran, I think that they've ever had uh, historically in terms of loss of life and, uh, and and certainly injuries. And this is just terribly embarrassed the security services. It's embarrassed the the uh, uh, the administration, the theocratic ruling administration, if you will. It's uh, it's uh, embarrassed the. Uh, um, Revolutionary Guards Corps. So they have elections coming up. And so they've just felt, you know, the, the assessment is that they just felt they needed to lash out to show that they were still a, uh, a very potent security military force. And uh, as, as one expert said, it's, it's as if they went to the, uh, they, they decided to hit things on the list of the usual suspects, which was to go back and hit things that had absolutely nothing to do with that attack. Uh, and then try to somehow construe it as if this was a counterterrorism thing, and then reminding everybody there was a terrorist action, uh, when in fact these are completely remote, remotely distant things. They have nothing to do with each other. But that's what the Iranians are doing right now. And I think it does show a, a fundamental weakness in the Iranian uh, regime that they felt that they had to do something like this. Now, this is going to have ramifications with Pakistan for quite some time. And I think it's going to have greater ramifications over time with Iraq. Even though Iraq, the, the, the ruling party is, uh, or parties, I should say, are predominantly Shiite. Uh, the country is predominantly Shiite, about 60%. Uh, no country likes to have its sovereignty violated in a way like this. And, and that's going to be a real thorn diplomatically in the side of Iraqi uh, Iranian relations. At an interesting time, when uh, when the uh, you know the head of uh, the prime minister in Iran was, or Iraq was talking about maybe it's time that the U.S. and the coalition forces leave. Um, I don't know if that's just rhetoric or if there's going to be something more substantive to that, but but it appeared that Iran was having a lot of sway. Then they did this, and I think they may have kind of pulled the rug out from under themselves a little bit in terms of what they were trying to accomplish. And not just with Iraq, you did mention Pakistan. And the minister there did say that it was even more concerning that this happened with that strike, despite the existence of several channels of communication between Pakistan and Iran. So it just seems that Iran is isolating and almost breaking down all of those diplomatic talks that it's been able to achieve with all of its neighbors in the Middle East. It was, uh, I have to say, diplomatically, uh, it was a very counterproductive move. Uh, Pakistan immediately recalled their ambassador. That's a pretty significant move on their end. And, and, and you know, just the geography is that they are neighboring countries. You know, you have uh, uh, the Baluchistan province borders uh, Iran. And, and of all the, uh, one of the areas in Iran that is most restive, shall we say, is the Baluchistan area. The security forces, when all the protests are going on, uh, there were reports coming out that the security forces were rather draconian in terms of how they're handling uh, Baluchi uh, minority groups uh, in that area. So, so there was already some uh, pre-existing fervor, if you will, uh, anti-regime fervor that was in that area. Then this happens, and they target this group right across the border, the group that has ties in Iran, 
Um, it just politically, diplomatically, uh, it was almost like a, a petulant child lashing out. And uh, of course, the politics are all internal, which is they have to show that they can do something. And this is all they can do. And, and the interesting thing is they have to show they can do something, but they don't want to do something that's going to trigger a direct confrontation with the United States or direct confrontation with Israel. So they kind of do this roundabout series of attacks and, uh, and, it, and they can claim that they did do something within their supporters. They go, see how strong Iran is. It's able to do this. Uh, but the regime is still pretty much disassociated with the vast body politic, if you will, uh, in, in Iran. And one of the problems they're having there is uh, this upcoming election may have uh, historically low voter turnout because people are just so frustrated with the regime. All right, Hal, I do want to move on. I mean, there's so many topics that we can discuss here when it comes to the Middle East, especially with these latest Iranian attacks. But let's get back to almost this uh, catalyst from right in the beginning, started October 7th, because Israel and the Hamas war, it's kind of what has started this entire turmoil turmoil in that region. We did get news today that medicine is en route to hostages in Gaza. What does this process look like? How long is it going to take for that medicine to actually reach hostages there? You know, it's interesting. I was watching that today. There was a, a, some a video of trucks coming in, and they said there was medicine coming in. I think that was medicine for, for Palestinian civilians that are in the Gaza Strip. Uh, that was aid that was coming across the border. And everything I've seen is that the, the medicine for the 40-some hostages that are on medication, Israeli hostages on medication, that that is still en route, that that has not gotten in there. And as near as I can figure out, and I was kind of looking at this today, uh, it appears it goes in there, and then at some point it gets handed off to Hamas, and Hamas actually has to disseminate that medication to the various hostages. Uh, that, to me, is a very imperfect system. A better system, uh, a more balanced system, would be if uh, they'd actually let the International Red Cross visit the hostages, deal, you know, interface with them as they had promised to do during the first uh, hostage uh, and prisoner exchange that they never followed through on. You know, if Hamas would let the International Red Cross go in there and actually provide this directly to the hostages themselves, I would feel a, a greater deal of assurance. But right now, when it does come in, it crosses the border. And once it crosses the border, it's pretty much under the control of Hamas, and they'll decide where that medication goes. I'm just hoping that it does get to those who need it, which are those hostages. But there's also uh, associated with this part of the deal was that a lot of needed medications for uh, Palestinian civilians is also coming in. And it does appear like the first loads of that may have already crossed the border today. Al, is this an optimistic sign that diplomatic talks in the region, they're going in a positive direction because we're getting that medicine in? It's an imperfect system, albeit, but still some progress to be made you know at, at some levels at least there, there's talking you know uh this is one of those things uh egypt has stepped in today they were very vocal about how they want to be more engaged in uh in the negotiations of course this one was working with the qataris and those are qatari planes that actually flew into egypt with the uh, medications uh that are going for the hostages and for the palestinian um uh, civilians as well so that's somewhat hopeful. There was also a lot of discussion yesterday and before that uh, they say there's been some real progress in it. Maybe another hostage for prisoner exchange deal may or may not be accompanied by a ceasefire. Uh, but then again, I, I, these things pop up and we've heard this sort of optimistic talk before. And I definitely say do not hold your breath when you hear this stuff because it you know sometimes it happens and and what oh well frankly only one time it actually did happen um although they did extend it well beyond the initial period so that was uh that was some progress there uh but the other side of that is you know they just they videotaped three hostages and then they killed two of the israeli hostages that were in the videotapes now i believe they blamed an israeli airstrike they always do blame an israeli airstrike when when hostages end up getting killed and uh and of course, uh, it takes a while because eventually they'd have to find, you know, the uh, the remains of the hostages and be able to do something forensically to figure out what exactly happened. But uh, uh, but 
you know, they're basically everything coming out there says that, you know, the, the hostages are in a very tenuous situation every day. And, uh, and Hamas is not above executing hostages. So uh, it's, it, uh, there's room for optimism. But on the other hand, everyone knows the clock's ticking and they want to get the hostages out because the longer they're there, uh, the lower and lower their chances of survival. All right, Hal, this is a live look out in Jerusalem for all our viewers to give them some context. Finally, I do want to bring it to back here to the U.S. and that big meeting between President Biden and congressional leaders today to discuss the funding, uh, future of aid to Ukraine and to Israel both. It seemed like it was positive, but we saw a, a good outlook going forward, it seems. Well, it's interesting. Uh, generally speaking, everybody came out. They were all very talking very positive and stuff. Uh, a number of analysts have looked at this and say, well, there's still a long way to go. You know, it's not clear what the Senate's putting forward when it actually gets out there is going to be anything close to what the House had. And so there's a lot of, lot of, lot of work to be done on that. And, and certainly on the House side, uh, there seems to be, uh, they're not satisfied that, that, you know, whereas there's talk about, oh, we have to increase the you know, border protection, more border security. And there's a variety of things that deal with, uh, you know, uh, parole. Uh, also, um, asylum, uh, a lot of big policy issues that have to be decided there, and it's not clear how much progress has been made on that. And uh, and I, I I do think that the the devil is truly in the details on this. But at least I, I will say one thing about this meeting: it it was you know it was obviously the president, White House, if you will, but it was also the the congressional leaders, both parties, and not just the top leaders, but also there were key committee chairs that were in the meeting as well. And I thought that was good that they brought in uh, basically these different, shall we say, power centers within Congress uh, into one meeting. So they're all in the same room talking about that. When you have something as urgent as this, and, and certainly if you're in Ukraine, you're feeling tremendous urgency to, uh, to, for Congress and the president to come together to get that aid passed because the Russians are putting tremendous pressure all across the front, but particularly in the Eastern front, um, that, that they, they want them to move quickly. And, and this the way the meeting was structured itself with everyone in the room talking uh, was a big step forward because one of the problems in the past has been, you get these meetings, you get, you know, you know, the majority leader, the minority leaders or, or whatever, uh, the speaker. And, uh, and it's just, you know, and they go back to their caucuses, if you will. They go back to their chambers, and um, there's just too much dissension within the room. So you need to have these others who have nodded and come together in the room. So when you go back and you start, you know, working on the details, at least you have greater consensus on which way to go. The the good news though is from this that I can detect is it seems to be more and more bipartisan consent. That uh, that they have to do this, and uh, and there seems to be bipartisan pressure on the border. The border, I think, initially was a, a little bit, uh, let's just say, a little bit one-sided on the partisan side. The concerns about the border, border concerns, have seemed to be at more bipartisan, and that that bodes well for a faster consensus on what needs to be done, what can be agreed upon in Congress, in order to get this funding uh, going downrange, particularly. To uh, as we mentioned to Israel, uh, they've used a lot of their war stocks in uh, fighting Hamas, and then also uh, for the war in Ukraine uh, and 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 holding off the Russian bear, and at the same time pushing back the Russian bear and setting up the conditions so that they can move forward, uh, hopefully in the spring and summer. All right, Hal, we're going to have to leave it at that. Always a pleasure chatting with you here. We covered a multitude of topics, and there really is so much more that we could be discussing, but we're going to keep in touch with you. We're going to keep connecting throughout this whole week. Hal Kemper, National Security Analyst, a retired Marines intelligence officer, and also co-host of the Stroud Podcast. Thank you so much.